Hello, folks, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Linda Wilson's Brolis of the Institute for Local Self Reliance's Composting for Community Initiative, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Also joining me are my colleagues Megan Matthews and Jordan Ashby, who will help uh, keep everything moving uh, smoothly. Uh, in this webinar, Adriana Jimenez Lopez, uh, who is a produce safety expert at the FDA, is going to provide an overview of the Food Safety Modernization Act produce safety rule, along with guidance on the current regulatory framework and requirements uh, as it relates to compost. Before I dive in, before we dive in into that topic, uh, just for those of you who might not be familiar with our work, ILSR's Composting for Community Initiative is advancing composting to reduce waste, regenerate local soils, create community development opportunities, and protect the climate. We work to catalyze distributed locally based composting options that include home, community, and on farm systems. And we do this in a number of ways. Uh, we work one on one with communities through technical assistance and policy support. We produce reports, infographics, and templates for composting sites. We host regular webinars like this one and a podcast. We also have a map that shows initiatives around the US and policies and programs that are advancing composting at this scale. We also offer technical training through our Neighborhood Soil Rebuilders Composter Training Program. Um, and we have an online Community Composting 101 certificate course, which covers composting fundamentals and the ins and outs of starting a community-based composting initiative. So check it out if you're interested. You'll find all of these resources and more on our website. On the Composting Initiative uh, main page, you'll see a Composting Resources drop-down menu on the right-hand side of the screen. And from there, you can select reports, podcasts, webinars, etc. So uh, this webinar, is, which is part of a series, is being brought to you through our involvement with the Million Acre Challenge, of which ILSR is a founding member. Uh, the Million Acre Challenge is a collaborative project that is supporting farmers in Im implementing healthy soils practices and regenerative agriculture on 1 million acres of farmland in Maryland and the Chesapeake region with a goal to do this by 2030. Healthy soils practices like the skillful production and use of compost on farms can improve farm resilience and profitability while also providing critical ecosystem services. You can learn more about the Million Acre Challenge on their website. Um, we can put that in the chat later. <clears throat> so this webinar is part of a series, um, as I mentioned before, and we started this series back in 2021 with a deep dive um, on technical and business considerations for composting on farms, as well as the many benefits of using high quality compost for the, for, for the soil, plants, and the climate. Last year, we heard from experts from Austria and Spain, where farms play a key role in those countries' distributed composting infrastructure. We also uh, covered state permitting pathways um, for a number of states here in the US uh, who are prioritizing on-farm composting. You can check out recordings from these webinars um, and find out more about the series on our website. But now we're gonna get to know each other a little more with some interactive polls. Megan, if you could start the first one. So first question. What best describes your affiliation? Select the best option. Are you a farmer, farm service provider, government, nonprofit or researcher, or other? Okay. And looking at the results, almost 50% are folks from government. Welcome to you all. And a good split of the other categories. So welcome to everyone. Uh, uh, next poll question, please. Okay, where are you located? This helps us determine how good we're doing, how well we're doing with our outreach. Um, are you in the Northeast US, Southeast US, Southwest US, Northwest US? or outside of the US. It's always fun to see when somebody from outside of the US participates.
as usual, we are doing the best in the Northeast, uh, but we have a good representation from the Southeast and Southwest. Need to do a little bit more in the Northwest, but hello to you, to those of you from outside of the US too. All right, final poll question. So what is your current relationship with composting or compost use? Select one of the following. And I suppose we could have made this select more than one and I did not. So uh, choose the one that speaks to you most directly. Um, I compost, I use compost, I regulate compost and or composting, I research compost and or composting, or pr I provide technical assistance around compost or composting. All right, majority of you compost, welcome composters. There's a good chunk of you who are providing technical assistance, which is fabulous. And then a good even mix of the, the other categories. Awesome, well, thank you all so much and welcome to everyone. So at this point, um, it's my pleasure to hand things over to Adriana, but first I'm gonna introduce her. Uh, Adriana uh, Jimenez Lopez, uh, serves as the produce safety expert with the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition Office of Food Safety in the FDA, where she provides technical assistance to produce stakeholders to assist with the technical questions and produce safety rule interpretations, and has many years of experience uh, providing outreach, implementation, and technical assistance around good agriculture practices and addressing resource concerns, including soil, water quality, and plants. Without further ado, welcome Adriana. Adriana, we might have to unmute you. Okay, there you go. You should be unmuted now. I'm still not right. hearing you. you. There you go. Everyone? Yes. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Always something going on with technology. <laughs> All right. Well, um, thank you for the introduction, Linda. Um, I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, I'm very excited to work with, you know, work with, in collaboration with you uh, to offer this presentation. Um, this webinar uh, wouldn't be possible uh, without you farmers, uh, regulators, um, and um, all you folks here, industry. Um, so I wanted to thank you so much uh, for being here. And I really hope that you find the information uh, that I will be presenting today very valuable. Um, so again, my name is Adriana Jimenez Lopez. Um, I'm from the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. I'm part of the Produce uh, Safety Network uh, for the Division of Produce Safety. And I cover the Northeast region. Um, so today we're going to be talking about uh, FDA's Food Safety Modernization Act, the Produce Safety Rule Standards for Soil Amendments, specifically biological soil amendments of animal origin, which are the ones that are covered uh, in subpart F of the Produce Safety Rule. Um, please know that this webinar is intended to benefit everybody. Okay, and when I um, when I say everybody, I not only um, mean you, it, you know, it, it also us as well. So the more that we do around uh, of this, the more that we are aware of all the different practices around each different region, so we can understand better these practices. Um, so now I'm going to go ahead and turn off my camera so that uh, it helps a little bit more with bandwidth, and I want to make sure that I don't lose any connectivity while I'm presenting. So um, let me go ahead and do that. And um, please, Linda, or um, if you can like, like, next slide, please. OK. All right, so before we uh, dig into the details of so part F, I wanted to share, we wanted to share here the seven rules that are under the um, Food Safety Modernization Act, which are all listed here on this slide. 
Um, today we're going to be talking about the standards for growing, harvesting, packing, and holding of produce for human consumption, uh, or also known as the produce safety rule. Um, the reason why it is here on the first, um, first on this slide is so that we, we want to emphasize that food safety starts on the farm. Um, but then we have listed here all the others, like uh, the preventive control for human foods, uh, preventive control for animal foods, the foreign supplier verification programs, um, the mitigation strategies to protect food against intentional adulteration, the sanitary transport of human and animal food, and then the accredited third-party certification. These are all part of FISMA. Uh, it doesn't mean that um, it applies for everyone here in this audience but it's all, always good to um, know uh, what, what these are. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, listed on this slide, we have the major subparts under the Produce Safety Rule. Um, so part F, which is green color here, is the one that we will be discussing during today's webinar. And this covers biological soil amendments of animal origin. So um, throughout this webinar and this presentation, you can begin to start um, applying FDA thinking into your operations. And we can discuss any areas of concerns where your practices are not consistent with our regulations. So today um, I will talk about how to use your biological soil amendments of animal origin in compliance with the product safety rule. Now, FDA um, do have a long history of, of uh, food safety and regulations, and this has, this, um, this has a lot of challenges uh, in order to make this rule feasible. So, um, so part F is not perfect, and we have some time to fix some concerns, uh, but we need to know about them. Okay, um, next slide, please. Okay, so here on this slide, uh, there are some resources for the produce safety rule. Um, so there is the preamble and the codified uh, produce safety rule. We've also worked on the draft guidance uh, with FDA's current thinking, and we will be talking a little bit more about this uh, on the presentation. And then there's the produce uh, small entity compliance guide. Now, this, this is all available online, um, and uh, Megan, Megan or, or Linda will, will also be sharing this on the, uh, on the link, um, sharing the link in the chat. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so one question that we get a lot, uh, and we get it you know, all the time, is what's not regulated under the Produce Safety Rule? And there's really a lot that's not regulated under the produce safety rule. For example, and I just mentioned it earlier, there's the uh, FDA guidance. Now you will see a lot of guidance out there, but guidance is different from regulation. So we need to be careful about what we are codifying under the produce safety rule. Another example uh, that I can think of, uh, there's a lot of good agricultural practices out there or gaps. And these are not regulated for many reasons. Uh, for example, um, so we know it is much safer to harvest a crop several days after overhead irrigation or precipitation events as opposed to same day or next day harvest, right? But codifying this in the produce safety rule will be um, most likely be considered overreach because it may not apply um, to all operators, right? So, you know, we, we leave this out of the regulation. Um, another good example is soil amendments that are not of animal origin. So these are not part of the produce safety rule, subpart so F, although uh, we know that all compost, uh, including those that are not of animal origin, can also have potential hazards. But uh, in this case, only so amendments of animal origin are currently regulated under the produce safety rule, so part F. Okay, so, um, so the produce safety rule really is it's designed to be the minimum one must do to help prevent foodborne illness. Um, and we need to also always keep in mind that the produce safety rule falls under this huge umbrella 
which is the under the food which is the Food Drug Cosmetic Act. And that's been out there for a very long time. So anybody that sells foods have the responsibility to make sure it's safe. All right, next slide, please. All right, so also so amendments um, have some potential for causing human foodborne illness. We know that nothing is 100% safe. So the next couple of slides here are from a graphic from uh, the qualitative assessment of risk to public health from on-farm contamination of produce. And the link is right at the, uh, at the bottom there. Um, we can share that in the chat as well. And this is a document that was developed a couple of years ago. Uh, and this, this is characterized as the science behind the produce safety rule provisions. And this graphic here is a very high level representation of our thinking behind subpart F. Now, if we look across the top, we have a scale that goes from the least to the most potential for, housing, for causing human foodborne illness. Okay. Now, on the left hand side, we have key factors that include type, treatment, there's the application timing and application methods. Now, if we start with the first row where it's type, we see that there is less potential to causing human foodborne illness for a non-biological so amendment. Um, let's say, for example, um, non-biological elemental fertilizer, which is considered less risky. It doesn't mean there's no risk, right? But but there but because you know there's there's risk associated with everything. But I mean, as, as we move across from less potential to most potential to cause foodborne illness, the most potential to cause food, human foodborne illness is human waste. Now, human waste should be expected to have the greatest number of human pathogens. That is why when you use human waste, you will expect the most amount of potential uh, to cause. Um, next slide. All right, now that we're familiar with the top row, let's walk through treatment, which is in the second row. Now, if you're manure, let's say you're using manure and it's, um, it's pasteurized, like heated, um, chemically stabilized uh, or pulverized, a good example, a heat poultry pellet that goes through a very extreme uh, rigorous process. Now, this process or these products under this process has much less risk associated than raw manure. So this is the least likely to cause human illness. Now in the middle, we see here that we have compost and we, we will be learning more about compost during the next um, couple of slides. And we do associate a little bit of risk of compost uh, with uh, residual pathogens, but it's, it's right in the middle here. Now, uh, next slide, please. It's the same slides. It's just, I think it changes there. <laughs> there you go. Now, so the third row um, is application timing. So as you move further from harvest with your application, you have less likelihood for contamination. But as you move closer to harvest, you create more likelihood for contamination. Okay. Uh, let's say if you're, for example, applying raw manure further from harvest. So that means there are more days between application and harvest. So we can say that there is less risk associated than if you were to apply um, the untreated raw manure closest to harvest. Okay, and then um, the last row here is the application method. Now, how are you applying your soil amendment? Now, if, you're, if the soil amendments contacts the harvestable portion of the crop that's gonna create much more likelihood for contamination versus if, if there is no contact or if efforts made to minimize contact. So if, if efforts are made to mini, minimize contact. Next slide, please. There you go. Okay. So there, there is a lot of different terms that are used to describe the different types of soil amendments, but there are three main categories. There are the soil amendments that can be 
chemical, such as the uh, elemental fertilizer. Um, there can be physical, like, uh, for example, perlite or rock dust, or biological. Now, not all biological soil amendments are of animal origin. So that's why you will see that little um, circle, red circle, uh, over there. Only biological soil amendments of animal origin are covered under subpart F. Okay, that's why um, it's separated there. All right, so let's run through some quick examples here. Uh, so yard trimmings um, will be biological, but not of animal origin. So they're not covered under the product safety rule. Um, and what about table waste? Now, table waste uh, is a biological soil amendment and of animal origin because humans are actually animals, right? We're, so this will be covered under the product safety rule, so part F. Now, uh, bone meal, feather meal uh, are also of animal origin. And another reminder is about compost. So compost, we know we it can have a lot of different feedstocks. But remember, if one of the feedstocks is of animal origin, then the entire compost will be considered a biological soil amendment of animal origin and subject to, to the produce approval subpart F. Okay, so know, know your sources and understand what you're applying. Okay, next slide. All right, so earlier uh, in the presentation, I uh, we shared the draft product safety rule compliance and implementation guidance. And uh, in that guidance, within chapter four, there are six parts. Listed, and, and they, they are all listed on this slide. And we're gonna go through them today, okay? Number three here, it has a big star there. And, uh, it's the most confusing to people just because people interpret that our pathogen testing standards as an endpoint for the biological soil amendment of animal origin. But in fact, this is an endpoint, but for the treatment process that the biological soil amendment of animal origin is processed. Okay. The reason why we don't require testing on the farm is because looking for a pathogen is like looking for like a needle in a haystack. Um, so treatment standards and microbiological standards for that treatment process is a very difficult concept for many people to understand because everybody wants uh, to see testing standards for their soil amendments. But I just wanted to make very clear that FDA will never ask a grower to provide microbiological testing parameters or standards for your soil amendments. What we are more interested and more appropriate for us to regulate is the process that the soil amendment has gone through. So we do require that you have a treatment process for your soil amendment if your treatment, if you are treating your soil amendment. Okay, um, next slide, please. Okay, so this is a flowchart um, that has everything that I just mentioned all in one place. Um, this is not an official FDA flowchart, but we're going to be breaking it down in the following uh, slides. Now, there are three swimming lanes here on this slide, um, and we're going to be discussing them during the rest of the presentation. Now, the first swim lane is do I need to comply? with subpart F. Now, if you are using a soil amendment of animal origin, you will need to comply, okay? The second swim lane is, um, is my biological soil amendment treated or untreated? If it is treated, you're gonna go one way um, through this chart, but if it's untreated, it goes the other way, okay? So there is really not a middle point. Okay, it is either treated or untreated. And the third swim lane is how may I use my biological soil amendment of animal origin. Now we wanna break this down. Um, next slide. Okay, so this here is a snip uh, from the compliance and implementation guidance. 
and we're going to walk through it together. Um, so we go back to number one, determine whether your soul amendment is a biological soul amendment of animal origin. And then do I need to comply with subpart so F? And, and to ensure this, we need to determine whether my soul amendment is of animal origin or not. And to do this, we need to pay attention to what's in your soil amendment. Like, uh, for example, let's say you're making compost and you're using uh, green waste, uh, green waste. And uh, let's say you add something to it, like fish emulsion, for example, that changes it, right? So you need to pay a really close attention to what you're applying in your compost and to understand whether or not you have to be in compliance with the product safety rule or not. Next slide, please. Okay, now that we know, let's right, let's say let's say we're working with a biological soil amendment of animal origin. We've already determined that uh, on number one. Now we can determine if our biological soil amendment of animal origin is treated or untreated. And let's talk all about the differences between treated and untreated. And remember, um, there is no gray area here. Um, the biological soil amendment of animal origin is either treated or untreated. It cannot be partially treated. If it's partially treated, then it will be classified as untreated. Okay. Um, so the guidance for industry, again, uh, it gives us a lot of examples of treated biological soil amendments of animal origin. Um, there's compost, uh, there's the heat treated, poultry pellets, fish emulsions, um, meals like bone meal, blood meals, feather meals. And then it also uh, mentions uh, biosolids. And biosolids, this is a highly regulated product uh, that goes through a very extreme rigorous um, process control. And um, so every state has different rules and regulations as of how you can use this. Now, we don't regulate this, EPA does. Um, so if you follow EPA rules around biosolids, you'll be able to use them without um, restrictions. Um, then another example of treated, we have the agricultural teas. Um, then, so the rule does not require uh, you or your supplier to conduct microbiological testing. And it is like what we discussed earlier. You uh, just cannot test a soil amendment to safety. But you uh, you do need to have a treatment process that must be scientifically validated to be able to treat your um, soil amendment as treated. Okay. Now, um, can you, yeah, you want one more, please? <laughs> okay. I just wanted to mention here, I'm gonna go over this a little bit later, but, um, so that the, the, a treated biological soil amendment of animal origin have two different treatment levels. And these are under 112.54A and 112.54B of the regulation. But again, we're gonna be discussing this a little bit, uh, or later in the next slides. Okay, and then uh, we have the untreated biological soil amendments of animal origin, and some examples. Uh, there's aged uh, manure, and you can um, advance one more. There, oh, sorry, <laughs> you had it there already. I'm sorry. Go back. There you go. Okay. Um, there's aged manure or stack manure, and manure is a great source of human pathogens, and just piling it up and leaving it for a period of time is not a validated treatment process. Next slide, please. All right, so I wanted to add a slide here about where to find some definitions that we have under the regulation. And if we go to part uh, the 21 uh, Code of Federal regulation, regulator, Regulations, part 112, uh, so part A, and when I say part 112, that's the product safety rule. And so part A, uh, section 112.3 states what definitions apply to this part. 
And with this part, again, it means the product safety goal. Um, next, please. One more. Thank you. And I just wanted to add these two definitions here um, that are relevant to this presentation. Where we define composting, and uh, we can read what's on the regulation here. And we also define what the curing is, which is a very important and necessary step to produce treat, uh, treated and stabilized uh, compost. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so we're back to the flowchart here. And we are still in the, um, this is the middle swim lane. So again, um, if we remember the first swim lane, we ask ourselves, do I need to comply with this uh, section? Are you using a biological soil amendment of animal origin? Okay, so we say we are. So now um, we want to answer this question, like is our biological soil amendment treated or untreated, okay? Now, if we look on the top left blue bubble, it says, is our biological soil amendment of animal origin process to completion per 112.54? Well, if the answer is yes, then we're working with a treated biological soil amendment of animal origin. But if the answer is no, then we're working with an untreated biological soil amendment of animal origin, which is on the um, red bubble there on the right side. So we need to know more about 112.54, right? Um, in order to answer the question. So we're gonna be moving on to question number three and get some more details. But for now, let's say that our answer is yes, we are pretty sure our product is treated. Um, also, I wanted to call out the middle bubble here uh, in the center, and this is the information about agricultural teas consolidated from, uh, um, yeah, from agricultural teas. Excuse me. All right, next slide, please. All right, so let's now talk about treatment uh, levels and processes. Okay, so let's say we've determined we're using a treated biological flow amendment of animal origin, and now we are on step number three. And we need to determine the appropriate treatment level and associated microbial standard. Now you have to ensure, you must ensure that the treatment is processed to completion, okay? Now the treatment levels are covered in 112.54a and 112.54b. And associated and, and their associated microbial standards for the treatment process are covered in 112.55a and 112.55b. So we can't really talk about 112.54 without also talking without uh, talking about 112.55. So A, A's are with A's, A sticks with A's, and B sticks with B's. All right, so let's dive into the difference between um, the two treatment process standards. But the key point and main difference between these two treatment process standards is with the process control. We expect 112.54 to have the most stringent process control. All right, next slide, please. All right, so the treatment levels in 112.54 provides uh, flexibility, okay? Any, you can use any chemical, physical, and or biological treatment process that is scientifically validated to meet one of two treatment levels and associated microbial standards, okay? So 112.54a, uh, or treatment A, this is our nuclear bomb approach. That's how we uh, refer to it. There's negative pathogen requirement here. It can be used with no restrictions, okay? An example of this is uh, the um, heat treated poultry pellets. And the reason is that, you know, the process for making these pellets, it's, you know, we take the poultry litter and put it in an oven where there are different process controls. You're cooking it, you're extruding it. You know, you're adding whatever additives you need, you're desiccating it. So, so everything, it's 
all under process control, right? Making sure that any surface contamination is killed and sealed and the process has been validated. Now, we, also, we always need to keep in mind that recontamination is a concern with 112.54a because there is because we know as we know it there is no microbial competition there okay and then you know also the, the application requirements are going to be different from 112.54a compared to 112.54b all right then we are uh, moving forward to treatment uh, b or 112.54b we have examples of uh, static composting and turn composting. Now here, um, all right, so here we have time and temperature requirements for same certain number of days plus adequate curing to meet our standards. And um, so, so one thing that uh, we need to keep in mind with respect to processing biological soil amendment of animal origin to completion is that um, when, let, let's say for example, that we are doing turned composting, okay? And the rule says that turn composting needs to be at a minimum of 131 Fahrenheit for 15 days, which don't need to be consecutive, with a minimum of five turnings follow, followed by adequate curing, okay? Now, we, need, we, we have to have in mind, and we know that every compost tile is unique, right? It has unique size, shapes, and material composition, right? In it, like feedstocks or different ingredients, all of which will affect how the pile will generate and maintain heat. Okay. Also, um, another, um, so, so to make sure it is exposed to the 131 Fahrenheit temperature that's specified in this example, um, of treatment, uh, turn composting. It mentions a minimum of five turning, right, by the rule. But we do not specify a time frame for each of the turns. So again, these factors that I mentioned earlier about the, you know, the size, the shape, the composition, it also can influence the appropriate timing for turning. And for that, re for these reasons, we don't specify a time frame for each of the terms, okay? And then, um, all right, next, next slide, please. Okay, next, next one, please. Okay, yeah, I just, um, I wanted to include here some more definitions that are under part 112 um, earlier, um, the previous one, was about static composting and then uh, turn, turn composting. Um, next slide, please. Uh, all right. Sorry, I wasn't drinking water. <laughs> all right, so let's look here at um, our treatment A for a moment, okay? So uh, again, this is our 112.55A our nuclear bomb approach, right? Um, so you have to have zero detected steria, salmonella, and E. coli, okay? So this is an environment that's gonna kill every single pathogen and every single particle throughout the entire soil amendment. Remember, this is the microbial standard for the treatment process, okay? And not the uh, biological soil amendment of animal origin itself. Um, next slide, please. And then this is 112.55B, um, uh, and this is the uh, microbial standards for the treatment process for our treatment B, which is our compost. And you'll need to meet both the salmonella and fecal coliforms testing requirements for this treatment process. But again, as we know, you don't need to test your compost. Okay, for any of these pathogens, because we already know that if you're meeting this time and temperature and all the other requirements, you will meet these standards. So there's no need for testing here. 
All right. Um, so Linda, uh, I don't know if uh, I should like make a quick pause here. I don't know if there's any burning questions or if I should keep going. Just um, <laughs> advise me sure. how you want. <laughs> I think we do have a few questions, so I think it might be helpful. Um, okay. Unless you are going to cover any of this later, then you just let me know. Um, but uh, one of the questions was, can you speak to uh, which feedstock would have the potential for more pathogen um, animal manure versus post-consumer food scraps? Or food scraps oh. in general is what they asked. Okay. So we need to go back again, like what, what's, what's in it, correct? Like, um, so you mentioned manure. Of course, manure has higher... Um, you know, higher uh, possibility for um, there to be a high risk of uh, contamination. And if you go back, um, maybe you can go back to the slides when where there's the risk associated a little bit more, 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 more. <laughs> there you go. Um, so it's all about like the risk, right? Like which one, um, depending on what's in there, what can cause more, um, it, what's, what can be more likely to, co to cause uh, contamination. And uh, of course, if it's untreated, uh, it's gonna have the high, um, yeah, it's gonna be like the, the top one to cause, to, to be, if that, if that was the question, correct? Um, it's basically uh, manure versus food waste. What's gonna be, waste. yeah. Yeah, so both of them, since they're pro it depends on like the treatment process like full manure uh, uh, manure it's of course not treated so it's gonna have high level of you know it's gonna be very um uh high but um the table food waste it depends on what's in there like we have to see what's in there um i don't want to say which one is higher risk at this point because there's a lot of different um, other factors that we need to consider. So um, maybe if there's, um, if, if, he can, if, they, if he can get a little bit more about what's, what's in it, maybe I can help a little bit more. Sure. Um, and I did, I did notice the distinction earlier between like pre-consumer and post-consumer and post-consumer, or I guess pre-consumer food scraps that don't have an animal origin materials probably would be considered pretty clean but yeah. post-consumer or anything that might have something of animal origin and then especially post-consumer because we are considered an animal as well would be considered on the higher end of the spectrum correct yes you're correct yes great okay awesome uh okay so then a couple of other questions about the treatment um parameters so uh one composter asked um if a stamp if a static compost pile that includes a small amount of manure is not reaching 131 degrees and the sort of time temperature parameters that you outlined that align with kind of PFRP uh, process for further further reducing pathogens, then would they would that be considered untreated? Yeah, so again, like, um, so let's go back to slides easier when I uh, have something in the screen to show. We'll go back to the treatment. Um, let's see what slide. Yeah, go a little bit more. Is this the one, the treatment A, treatment B? Um. I'll go go a little bit more. I think I think I, I covered that a little bit later in the presentation. So let let's hold on to that question to a little bit later because I think I okay. do cover a little bit more about that. Great. Okay. And then perhaps you'll have the same response to this. But we know okay. some uh, composter composters who also uh, use vermicomposting or worm composting, where they will, you know, they'll they'll compost, do the aerobic composting uh, until they hit the sort of time temperature requirements, but then they'll put that compost, or at least they'll hit the highest temperatures and then they'll basically give that to the worms um, for finishing. 
and then that vermicast is added to uh, growing areas. How would you how would you break that down? Whether it's, it's untreated or treated, if it's gone through the vermicomposting process after heat treating. Yeah, I mean it could either go. It depends again, like on how it was treated or how what what kind of process control it took. Vermicomposting, it's for the most part like it's kind of like in the middle. Um, but I think I do have a slide about vermicomposting. It, okay. It, it's there. But Let's, if not, yeah, I can, I can, we can go back to there, that one as well. Okay, um, I'll highlight them. So we should just keep okay. going then. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, so we're at, um, right, so we are at factors one second. We're at slide 24, correct? <laughs> no, I think we're at, let's Yeah, see. we're at 24. Oh, we are at 24. Okay, all right. So, all right, so we've determined, okay, so going back, let's go back to uh, the little, the different, uh, so, we, so we've determined number one, right? We've determined whether your soil amendments, um, is a biological soil amendment of, of animal origin or not? Then uh, we say yes. Um, then we determine if it is treated or untreated. If it is treated, uh, we determine the treatment levels and the associated microbiological standards, uh, which are under 112.54 and 112.55. And we are now at number four. Okay, now let's determine how we can apply our biological soil amendment of animal origin. Okay, uh, next slide, please. All right, so some factors to consider in how to apply your biological soil amendment of animal origin is the um, treatment status, right? If it's treated or untreated, uh, the level of treatment, right? If it's uh, the treatment A or our nuclear bomb approach or treatment B, and then uh, some application restrictions. Now the application methods that uh, you could use and uh, the likelihood of contact between the biological soil amendment of animal origin and the harvested portion of the cover produce are also important factors that we have to consider. And in addition, we also should consider the type of cover produce, you know, like the maturity of the produce at the time of application, and the location of the growing area, as well as uh, different environmental conditions. Now, FDA um, considers application methods as having either uh, direct contact with cover produce, that it minimizes potential for contact with cover produce, or having no contact with cover produce. All right, next slide. Okay, now application requirements are under 112.56, okay? And first we're going to review uh, the application uh, requirements for untreated biological soil amendment of animal origin. And then uh, we're gonna compare it with our treated uh, biological soil amendments of animal origin. Now, the only requirement right now for raw manure is that it must be applied in a manner that does not contact cover produce during application, okay? So let me repeat that again. Uh, when you're applying a biological soil amendment of animal origin that is untreated, you cannot apply it in a manner that it contacts your produce, okay? Now, if you apply an untreated biological soil amendment of animal origin and it does not contact the cover produce during application, and it also minimizes the potential for contact with cover produce after application. You must wait a, and now um, it is, it says reserve <laughs> number of days until harvesting the cover product, okay? Now we are actually working very hard on this reserve number here, 
there's some research going on and we've done some risk assessment efforts and we're working on it. Now we always uh, like to reference like the uh, USDA National Organic Program. Um, they have the 90 to 120 days to harvest interval, depending on how you're growing your crop, okay? And this is a good standpoint, a starting point, okay? But again, this is a guidance, this is not a rule, okay? If you are an organic grower and you want that USDA um, NOP uh, seal, you need to pay attention to this 90 to 120 days, okay? Now, this concept uh, of, of uh, the USDA um, concept, uh, it wasn't born out of food safety concept, okay? But once FDA started to get into this produce safety, um, USDA then decided that they're, they're gonna um, defer to us once we figure that out. That out. Well, okay, but again, if you're already using that, uh, the FDA is not taking any exceptions to those harvest inter intervals, okay? Now, if you apply any untreated biological soil amendment of animal origin, and it does not contact um, the cover produce during application, and there is no contact after application, then the waiting period until harvest is zero days. Okay. And uh, a good example about this uh, is let's let's think about an apple orchard. Um, now we know that you know where where the untreated uh, biological soil amendment of animal origin will not have contact with fruit, which is you know we know it's up in the tree. So you may be adding manure at the base of, of those fruit trees. And well, I mean, you, you can't really collect drop produce because that's another that's another part of our regulation. Um, so you know, you, you cannot harvest an apple once it drops into manure, into that manure, or any soil for that matter. Okay. And I also wanted to highlight, maybe mentioned uh, here, uh, minimizing the potential for for contact after application and root crops. Okay. Now root crops, as we know. They're grown in the ground, and there is really no way to minimize contact after application. Okay. Now, officially, you cannot plant root crops in fields where untreated biological soil amendment is applied. Okay. Um, the only officially acceptable uh, biological soil amendment of animal origin that you can apply for root crops is one that meets our treatment A process, uh, which is our nuclear bomb approach. Okay, you know, the sterile stuff. But unofficially, and you know, if you're following the NLP 120 days to harvest, then there, there's no problem with, with us. And right now we know this is a big issue. Uh, we understand it is a big issue for growers and we're working to fix this, okay? We have never had a compliance case or anything against this, um, but we're working on it. All right. Um, next slide, please. Okay, now let's talk about application requirements for treated biological soil amendments of animal origin. And for our treatment A, 112.54A, um, there is uh, there, there is um, no restrictions. You, know, you can apply it in any manner during and after application. And there is zero days to, har um, to harvest interval. Uh, next slide. Now, for our treated biological soil amendment of animal origin that meets our treatment B standard or uh, compost, it has to be applied, must be applied in a manner that minimizes potential to contact with cover produce during application and after application, okay? And we have zero days to harvest restrictions. But remember, um, there is residual pathogens in compost, so we need to pay attention to how you are applying it. So, I mean, you can't just uh, blast your compost uh, across your leafy greens, for example, but you can pay attention to how you apply it and how, how safe. Okay, next slide. 
All right, so now we are here at the third uh, swim lane, and it combines uh, 112.54, 112.55, and 112.56. And how may I use my biological soil amendment of animal origin? Now, depending if it is treated or untreated, uh, we go to the application's requirements per 112.56. Okay. Now, if we start uh, with the green treated uh, bubble and then move down to the blue bubble, where it asks, like, is the treated biological soil amendment of animal origin uh, handled, transport, and stored per 112.52 B and C? Now, if you are using a biological soil amendment of animal origin with treatment 112.54 a, which is our nuclear bomb approach, right? There, yes, you're, you're pointing the right one. Um, no, there's no pathogens in it. Uh, and you have proper records, okay? Records, uh, yeah, there you go. And you have proper records that shows it has gone through a process that eliminates all pathogens in every single particle of that product, and you apply it. You have no restrictions and zero to no days to harvest. Now, for example, uh, let's say we have, we grow leafy greens, you know, and we know they grow very quick. So there are very few days to harvest. And you see it, let's say you see it with some deficiencies, like um, you, you, you notice they have like chlorotic leaves, for example. Now you can use a heat treated poultry pellet that meets this definition. Now, uh, we know it is a low crop, and there is probable potential for contact with that crop, but we have no restrictions during or after application here. Okay, now if you're using a biological soil amendment of animal origin with our treatment 112.54b, which is our compost, now this is a level which we expect pathogens to be reduced, but there will always be some residual pathogens, okay? But it's a very low level. Okay, maybe even below de detection. But again, like um, there can be some 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 pathogens there. Okay, and we know that. So let's say um you're using that compost, okay, and you have the proper records, okay, time, temperature, and you have so here you have to minimize contact during and after application, and then there are zero days to harvest. For example, let's go back to the leafy green example. And uh, you, we know it has those deficiencies. Now you could apply compost to that low growing crop, even if there is a potential for contact with the crop, but you need to minimize the potential for contact, okay? So this, uh, you know, you, you have to figure out like, how can I uh, apply this compost, okay? So you're not going to blast the compost um, across your bed of leafy greens, okay? So, so you need to be careful how you are applying it and you carefully uh, targeting this application. And uh, we know like there's a lot of ways that you can apply compost, you know, like uh, some, of, some of you all like uh, use machinery, some use uh, shovels, you know, but as long as you're applying compost in a way that minimizes contact during and after application, okay? So we, we should be okay. And again, um, if it is uh, not treated, okay, then it is untreated. And if we go to the red untreated bubble, there you go, uh, then you have raw manure, okay? And if we follow the untreated line down, okay, there's a curve around there, uh, and then we see it says untreated biological soil amendment of animal origin, except for human waste, uh, per 112.53, okay? And if you're uh, going to use human waste, you again need to make sure you're following the EPA regulations for class A biosolids. And this will meet, uh, we, say, we can say this, this meets our nuclear bomb uh, treatment process level. Okay, so if, now, if you're using animal waste, uh, no, uh, any animal waste that is untreated, if it is applied in a manner that does not contact the cover produce during and after application, 
then there is zero date harvest, okay? You have to make sure there is no manure getting in contact with your harvestable portion of the commodity. Now, if it is, um, we're still looking down at the red part here, but uh, if it is applied in a manner that does not contact the cover produce during application and minimizes potential for contact with cover produce uh, after application, then the days to harvest is reserved at this time. Okay. And then we also talk a little bit about the NOPs, uh, 90 to 120 days interval, uh, which is a good starting point. Now, if you're, again, if you're already using that, FDA is not taking any exception um, exceptions to, to those harvest intervals. Okay, next slide. Okay, so here uh, we are now on number five, uh, and here we here are the requirements uh, for handling, transporting, and storing your biological soil amendments of animal origin. Okay, and here are some recommendations. This is all in again in the compliance and implementation guidance. Um, so uh, just make sure to evaluate your practices. Um, for your biological soil amendments of animal origin, uh, for the potential to contaminate uh, your growing areas, your water sources, even other soil amendments. Okay? Um, evaluate how and where you're storing them. Be careful, don't cross contaminate. Uh, don't cross contaminate. Um, evaluate the use of equipment and tools. And also, uh, it's good to always ensure that your personnel are trained and aware about all the different routes of contamination that are associated with the uh, biological soil amendment of animal origin and how to take corrective measures. Okay? And again, this is all in the uh, compliance and implementation guidance. And we can uh, make sure that you uh, have the link. It is available online. Um, all right, next slide. And now we're number six, which are our requirements for records. And that's um, all of our record, all, all records are covered in part 112.60. And um, again, like um, records are only required for uh, treated biological soil amendment of animal origin. Okay. Now, um, when you're buying, it from somebody so let's say you're buying your compost you are required to maintain documentation okay at least annually that the process that was used by your supplier to treat the biological soil amendment of animal origin is scientifically validated okay it's a scientifically validated process that has been uh, carried out uh, with appropriate uh, process monitoring like for example, uh, monitoring of time, temperature, moisture, um, and pH. And a good example uh, of such documentation is a certificate of uh, conformance. And that certificates uh, that these conditions have been met. Now you also need to make sure it has been handled, conveyed, uh, and stored in a manner and in a location to minimize the risk for contamination by and by an untreated uh, biological soil amendment of animal origin. Okay. Now um, another example. Let, let's say you're, uh, for example, applying uh, compost in a way that minimizes potential for contact. Okay. And you are making the compost yourself. On the farm, then you need to pay attention um, to your process controls, uh, which are time, temperatures, uh, number of turnings if you're making windrow, um, and then like any any form of documentation is acceptable, okay? Provided that it does it, it, it includes the information required by 112.60 and the general requirements uh, that are um, under subpart uh, O. Okay, uh, next slide. 
And this has more information uh, that's from the uh, compliance and implementation guidance. Now, for, for a treated biological soil amendment of animal origin that you uh, produce for your own uh, covered farms, you must establish okay, and, and keep documentation that the process control uh, were completed. Okay? Now, you, you should evaluate you, need, you should evaluate um, your your farm's specific process. Okay, we know every farm's different; it has different processes. But you need to ensure and determine uh, what type of documents you need to comply with the requirements uh, of records. Now, such documentation for treated, uh, turned compost could include, for example, and, and uh, here's. Uh, Couple examples. Uh, there is, a, you know, you can uh, keep a logbook that lists the following, like the date the composting began, the nature of the materials, like for example, a compost that contains a raw coal manure, um, the carbon and nitrogen radio for, ratio for the materials, the temperature profile, the date, time, and location where you took the temperature. Uh, the date and the time of each turning events, the date and results of moisture, of moisture content and pH determinations, um, the date of any addition of water, the date insulation, if any, uh, was added, um, the end date of the composting and the curing process. And uh, please note that uh, this list here is for uh, just, 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 a, just an example. Okay, this is just for illustrative purposes only, and uh, it it will not uh, be applicable in all cases. Okay. All right. Next slide. Okay. Uh, now, if, uh, for example, a farm is uh, receiving from a uh, third party, uh, a treated biological soil amendment of animal origin that uh, will be subject to a further um, treatment process on the farm. The farm could choose to obtain uh, from the third party documentation um, about the process that was used to treat those biological soil amendments of animal origin and how they were handled, conveyed, and, and stored. And this here is another example uh, from the guidance. Um, so these are uh, records that you can have um, a document that includes a statement like this one here. And again, these are just examples. Uh, this is just suggested language that composters can apply to their bag. It's not required, but it's. Uh, I do want to make sure that there are no requirements about how this needs to be written. And um, so there are some other examples that other um, partners have done. For example, the um, Produce Safety Alliance also worked on some other resources, such as um, an example of a certificate of conformance, and also uh, other documentation that are required for commercial so amendment supplier and this, uh, these are all available online. Um, oh, thank you, um, Jordan, for adding some links in the chat here. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, so that's the end of my presentation uh, here. Um, here's for more information. Some uh, this is the FDA website. Um, we have what we call our uh, FISMA 10, and you can uh, go um, into this website here, and you can click Contact Us, and you can uh, submit inquiries. Um, but also, um, next slide, please. I wanted to share my contact information here. Um, please, uh, any question that you may have, feel free to contact me anytime. Um, I'm here to assist you. And uh, in closing, and on behalf of my team, the Produce Safety Network, 
I want to thank you for your time today. Okay, and again, here's my contact information. And also, um, um, we just recently created a uh, Spanish uh, inbox. Uh, if uh, it is something that, um, yeah, that you find uh, it may be uh, useful, please, uh, you can also reach out at us in this uh, box. Um, all right, well, I'll turn it back to Linda and uh, team. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you, Adriana. Uh, let's go ahead and stay on this slide just in case we need to go back to any of your previous slides. Yeah. Um, but I'll just mention that um, in the post webinar survey, we'll ask folks about their interest in a Spanish version version of this webinar, just because, uh, yeah, if anyone in your network would benefit from that, please just let us know. So thank you for mentioning that resource, Adriana. Um, and so some questions for you. Um, I just wanted to, a couple of clarifying questions for me. When you mentioned covered produce throughout this uh, discussion, that does not actually mean produce that is physically covered in some way. It's produce that's going to be eaten or that's being produced for human consumption, correct? Um, yes, Linda, I'm sorry. I should have maybe uh, explained that a little bit more. Uh, every time I mention covered produce, I mean uh, produce that's covered under the produce safety rule. Now, not, not every produce is covered under the produce safety rule. And um, you can go to, um, and I can either write it in the chat or maybe uh, send you the link. But if you go to the subpart, um, find it, subpart A of the regulation, 112.2, uh, there's a section that talks about what produce is not covered by this part, okay? And then 112.1, it, it has a list there of what food is covered by this part. And by this part, I mean uh, the produce safety rule. So that, that's what I meant when I said yes. cover produce. It's the ones that are covered under the produce safety rule. Thank you. Uh, just making sure. I uh, appreciate that explanation. And then I guess in a similar vein, these rules or this rule applies to produce being sold for human consumption or just being grown for human consumption? Um, the rule, yeah, okay, so, I mean, so grown and sold, you know, it can be the, the same thing, right? Because you, you you know, you grow, you sold. Now, if it's for your own consumption, you're, I mean, if, if, if you're producing for your own and you're not selling when you're, you know, um, then you're not covered. Um, there's, um, and I can share that as well, if it's helpful. We have a flowchart that shows um that 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 shows very clearly you know help you determine if you're covered or not and one of the uh one of the questions it's like are you a farm so because because this rule only regulates farms right we don't regulate anything else it, we, we regulate farms and uh one question is are you a farm if you answer yes then it goes to the next question and a lot has to do with like um if you sell, you know, um, and if you sell, it ha you have to have certain uh, uh, sales. Uh, th there's a, now if you, let's say you, you sell, if you make 25,000 a year of produce, um, cover produce, then you're covered by the rule. And now again, I, it may be confusing the way I'm saying it. Um, I, can, I can definitely send you um this flowchart and you can share with all the attendees if Great. it's helpful and it can show you you know how you determine if you are covered or not right so we're zooming out a little bit from subpart f right to uh or this portion that you've been covering here just to give even more of the background of who's who and what is covered under this rule so i think that would be helpful um so some of the remaining questions um well i don't know if we wanted to go back um to some of the ones that we didn't quite answer but yeah. basically um we talked about <clears throat> a pile 
a static compost pile that's not reaching 131 degrees, that would be considered untreated, correct? If that has uh, a no, small amount of compost, animal manure in it? Yeah, no, like, like compost, it's considered treated. Um, like it's like what I mentioned earlier. Like let's say you um, you have your pile of compost, right? And then um, of course you need to have that 131. But I mean, we all know like, let's say for example, you take your thermometer and put it on your pile of compost, you reach your 131, right? But that doesn't mean the rest of their compost is gonna be 131, right? Cause it's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. <laughs> and so that's why it is, um, it is not considered under treatment A, which is our nuclear bomb approach. Now compost is are considered under our treatment B. So um, there, you know, it, it, it won't kill everything. We can think there's, there may be some, you know, some, some things in there. And that's why uh, the determine, uh, depending on the treatment level, um, it's how you are going to apply it. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Then it gets back to the specifications of whether it's coming into what kind of pro produce it's being applied to and whether it's coming into contact and how long between the in exactly. interval to harvest. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that clarification. OK. And then in terms of the vermicompost, I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to add to that uh, discussion that we had earlier. Um. Yeah. Like, OK. Um. Can you? repeat the question again i'm sorry yeah. no, no <laughs> worries so basically uh even if so we know some composters who are doing hot composting for like the first part of the composting process and then sort of after these kind of higher temperatures have been hit and it starts to head into the next phase of composting um then they put it into um like a worm composting system um and yeah does the fact that it's being processed through the worm's body affect the definition of whether it's treated or untreated okay yeah that's a very good question i mean and and again like again it depends what's in there of course like how you treated it like um other than the temperature because if it's considered compost then it's compost right i mean it's like i say earlier it's either treated or untreated um right and then it comes I, down to application yes it all goes down to like how you're going to apply it because if it's treated you apply it uh, in that way if it's not treated you apply it in another way then yeah but um yeah i will need to have a little bit more information to like you know give you a better answer so um, maybe like I don't know if you can like um, ask um, the admin yeah, we, to like reach out to me and I can definitely get back to him and follow or follow up on this. Yeah, so uh, we can definitely follow up to make additional clarifications. But basically, like if there's compost, whether it's hitting those the temperature time relationship or not is still going to be it's still going to be considered not 100 percent sanitized or whatever and so then it then it comes down to how you're applying that product mm -hmm. whether it's hot compost or vermicompost probably yeah yeah okay so we'll try to follow up to see if we can get any additional uh clarification but that that sounds good for right now mm -hmm. um and then there's a couple of folks who are still trying to grapple with um, how to sort of assess where on that sort of spectrum of most likely to produce uh, to uh, pr um, create human pathogen potential um, is someone just was trying to see if they understood pre-consumer food scraps with raw meat or raw animal blood would be more risky than post-consumer uh, food waste that contains fully cooked meat. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Okay, and again, it goes back to the uh, treatment process, like right. um, 
because we always like it's it's always at the you know like how you treated that right. so the post i mean it it of course i mean it's raw i will consider that as raw um like not treated for sure but uh the other part we'll have to consider we have to see how you um yeah what you did with it you know how how was the treatment process right and then so once we know we can determine um yeah if it's uh falls under what we call our nuclear bomb approach or or if it's uh considered more as like our treatment b mm -hmm. less stringent yeah right i think folks have they're trying to assess like the difference different feedstocks they may be handling and whether like they're assessing how risky that feedstock is individually as compared to another one so like um animal manures versus food scraps that have some animal byproducts in it um if folks wanted to learn more about that part of things do you have any resources in the fda that any research um that you could point to i can check our research i'm sure there has to be something out there um yeah i can i can see uh i right now on top of my head i cannot think of any specific research okay. but yeah I'll, yeah that's another thing i can get back to you um definitely and okay. and again i mean it's um like i mentioned like it's either treated or untreated so i mean um doesn't it I mean it matters how how um you're um you know uh, tr tr treating the compost of course right but, but again at the end you know it, it really goes to untreated or treated like it doesn't matter how how risk how if it's more risky or not um if it's treated then you know like we have different um application methods different uh you know going forward versus if it's untreated right so yeah your presentation your perspective really just comes down to the rule and how it applies and i think some of these questions are probably more towards uh something a little bit outside of the scope um of of your work which is trying to gauge um the potential for pathogens and um yeah uh but sounds like as the rule as the this subpart f applies it's basically it's either treated or untreated and then it determines how you're applying it so it's just that basic framework um and uh another person asks uh if you could give a an example of the sort of the treatment a option um blasting. there was a mention of not blasting untreated compost to avoid potential contact with produce. And they're asking about what kind of equipment or machinery could be used to do that type of application that avoids contact. Um, I mean, uh, so the rule doesn't really, um, you know, it's very flexible in terms of wow, what you're using. So you can actually use anything. I mean, um, you just have to make sure that, um, you know, if for example, it's, uh, it's compost, so you have to make sure that it minimizes contact after application, you know, like, but it really, um, we don't really have like any, you know, any, any rules about or, or, or requirements about what type of equipment to use, mm -hmm. um, all up to the farmer and the grower to, to, um, yeah. Right. Okay. So yeah, it was my mistake. It wasn't about, um, the treatment a, um, it was just, uh, untreated compost and how to avoid contact with produce so it'd be interesting to and, think uh and again how... i mean you have to like uh, you know of course it depends on what you're growing like and i think i mentioned this a little bit earlier like let's say you have your your you know an apple or shard of course an apple is up in the tree right so i mean i guess um it may be a little bit easier when you apply your manure there because you're not you know it's not in contact versus if you were to grow let's say uh strawberries because mm -hmm. they're more you know down there so so it's really up to you how you um you know it's it's really up to the farmer to uh you know um find a way that it minimizes contact great okay 
thank you. Um, and then I think there's the final question. Um, somebody's just wondering whether there's anything in the produce safety rule that covers application of these soil amendments to rangelands that are intended for livestock grazing uh, that would then be maybe uh, consumed, like meat for meat consumption, livestock for meat consumption. Is there uh -huh. anything in your purview that would affect that kind of application? No, so the uh, produce safety rule only, um, you know, only only if you're growing and you're applying this uh, on cover produce, then um, that that's that's the scope of the, this rule. Now, if you're applying it in a uh, another, you know, like like you mentioned, a uh, place where you mean um, you say like where they have livestock, um, right? Then that 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 that's out of scope of the produce safety rule. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I don't see any other questions. So, Adriana, thank you so much for your time and for guiding us through this uh, somewhat complex but uh, logical uh, rule. And we will look forward to following up with you and seeing how we can get some maybe follow-up uh, resources to our participants. But at this point, thank you everyone for participating and have a great weekend. Thank you, Linda and Tim. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.